Hi, I'm Tertessa Babich, Mary Wilson's daughter. Over the years, mom did thousands of interviews. She loved talking about her life and the experiences she had during her storied career. Throughout her career, mom loved interacting with everyone at the record label. In the following interview from 2017, mom sat down and talked with two of her associates from the label, Harry Rayner and Andy Skirl. They talked about mom's earliest days in Detroit, her time waiting on Motown's front stoop, her success at Motown, and becoming a global superstar. So here you go, mom in her own words. It's just audio. Yeah, because what I think I've always wanted to do, so since we're here, I thought, well, we all love each other, know each other, why don't we just talk? And if it becomes a podcast, I'll let you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see That's what you're okay, saying. right? Okay, oh, I, But I think I, I want to have something okay, in the you. bank. So if you're I okay, you. I'm doing this for a little while. Okay. No, I understand you know. now. We were just talking the other day about, you were just saying like the 60s. Like that's more than 50 years ago. And when I was growing up, or when you were growing up, you said your parents were listening to music from the ragtime era. That didn't happen. They were listening to uh, the blues. See, this is something we, as Black people, we've lost our own sort of music. And at that time, Black people were listening to their music, Mm. which was the blues. Mm. That's what also, when you look at all the history behind the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, the Yardbirds, I mean, everybody, they were from, you know, England, they were all listening to the blues, which was the American sort of black music. So that's what I grew up listening to. So don't you think Who's Loving You was Smokey's version of the blues? Yeah. It all comes from that. That's, the thing is, is that, yeah, Who's Loving You? And everybody at Motown sang that song, okay? <laughs> I know, but... <laughs> now we know why. Look, look, no, look, no, Harry, 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 listen. Now we know why we all did that, because Motown owned Joe Bat, owned yeah. the music, right? So <laughs> they get, now they get music from everybody, whoever was at Motown singing Who's Loving You. That's right. Now they call it vertical integration and branding. In branding, right? <laughs> Yeah, now that's what it's called now, yes. Mm -hmm. See? You know, what does it look like now to come into New York? I was just, the reason I'm thinking about this is last night I showed, um, I was watching the James Brown documentary, Mr. Dynamite, which has a clip from the Tammy show. Yeah, I was, I I did that, that, right? They're the clip of you in the mirror with your curlers and Diana's walking by, and it's really focused on everybody getting ready. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking... So she's coming in, and now she's got to get ready for another show. And how many shows do you think you've done? How many shows? I think, oh, my God. <laughs> how many times have you been in that mirror kind of? Yeah, yeah almost every night. I don't know. <laughs> sure. It just hit me right. The first time we ever did a nightclub was out of the country, and that was in 1963, asking how many times we've been doing all this yeah. stuff. So it started way back then. It's 1963. Maybe we should add, count it up, see how many times we've been in front of that mirror. I love being in front of the mirror. The only thing missing now is I can't have all my champagne that I used to have. Can't drink as much anymore. So <laughs> I still do, though. Like good champagne. Now now I can only drink good champagne. Harry, Universal owed me a good glass of bottle of champagne tonight. Thank you. Tomorrow night. Okay. It's on the podcast. <laughs> okay. Take care of Sorry. It. Go ahead. It's all right. Do you, do you still get up for the show? Do I still get up? I got to. I mean, I can't sleep through the show. No, but I mean, I know the what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I love it. This is the time when I when I'm on stage, I'm like in heaven. When I first met Flo, Diane, and Betty uh, in '59, yeah. 1959, and we became the primates, I remember at that moment I was like 13 and a half years old. That moment I knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. At 13 and a half. So to tell you, yeah, I'm still doing that. Still. Do you feel differently about your shows now than when you did it then? Do you feel the same? Do you feel what? Different how? Different how? Well, now it's now it's now it's your show. It's well, you. Well, yeah, but you, you answered the question. Of, okay, okay. You answered the question. Feel, do, do you feel? Ah, <laughs> okay, right, you got to put me on the spot. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. That, that, but that's why I wanted to clarify okay. because the answer is. I feel, I still have that same excitement, yes. The difference is that before it was not just my excitement, it was excitement of the whole, and that was fabulous. 
the difference in that whole and me is that now it's more centered on me. And so I have a different perspective of me from being on stage. And I absolutely adore it. I enjoy it. It sometimes it's it's scary, but the same feeling of of, of knowing that that's where I belong is there. The same feeling mm-hmm. is there. Is can you say that acute? That would be acute, right? It's the same acute emotion, wow. which is fabulous. So when you got were kids, what was the motivation? We were so never kids. kids. We no, were children. We were young ladies. We were young ladies even. Then. Never kids. The prime ads. So people have said to me, oh, you know, back then everybody sang. You think about the guys doing these doo-wop groups, everybody sang. The tops were always to get, because they sang, right? Did you have that, was that the same motivation, like just to get together and sing, or was there another motivation for it? You know, it has to go back to that ethnic thing. You know, a certain group has certain expertise in certain areas. And I think for us, the black area, singing was something you did as maybe sports. It was something you did as a as a as a group of people. Part of the fabric of your life. Um, yeah, it's like your the, community. It's, it's like your it's like your everybody, even people who couldn't sing, sang. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's your energy. That's how the energy comes and that's how it comes out. And so even though you did that, even though maybe you were not You know, you couldn't really get up there and do an Aretha Franklin kind of run (laughs) as long as your hearing was in harmony. You know, you you, you knew pitch. Most people knew pitch and that kind of thing. So I think when we did it, it was more that we all had that same energy and it it was all a harmonic energy. And yeah, it was something that I, I had when I was growing up, but I never thought I was a singer. You know, I would get out of bed. I would wake up singing. But I never thought I was a singer. Not until I started, you know, singing. And then I I, I thought that everybody did that. I didn't know it was anything different. So we, I think we we look at Detroit and Motown it was a water. coming up. It was a water. Yeah, there, there's some sort of <laughs> mythical thing like, oh my God, there's Lamont. There's Eddie Holland. Jackie Wilson. I, was that nor- that was probably normal for you? It was normal. There were a lot of it people was normal. who were talented and hanging out. Well, you you know you know, and this still goes back to the the old days. Uh, I shouldn't say older days. They days in the country, in the cotton fields, in in the South, when black people on the on the uh, whatever they used to call that, you know, where people lived and all that stuff, they sang to get through the day. They sang to get through the night. That's all they did. So that's what I'm saying. Whether you had a voice or not. Is something that still did out of the experience. And so that's why in in Detroit, in Chicago, you know, in, in different places, that migration of peoples who went to certain areas, that's what they took with them, that experience. And so that's why in Detroit you had that. It wasn't that there were more in Detroit than there was in Chicago or, you know, some of the other places. It was that we we did have Motown there. We did have a company that sort of had the doors open. So those who could sing. And I I saw the Motown musical the other day and Barry was saying to to Smokey or something, go out and and we go out and we get these people. Well, that didn't happen. The people came to them. (laughs) You're right. We hear you are a place where we can be ourselves and sing. That's an extraordinary achievement, just like, just for that. No one said that but me. Just like now they're using the no-hit Supremes mm-hmm. everywhere. That was yes. my, that was my thing. I started that. Now everyone's using it. I'm like, I've got to start trademarking all my little patenting, all my little remarks, whatever, because they were mine. I want to talk about that, but where, who did you look up to? Well, growing up, I looked up to people like Lena Horn at the Waters, because these were the faces that we saw, mm-hmm. where we could see from outside of our community. The main person I looked up to was my mother. My mother, I looked up to because I felt safe, and I, it was it was one of those things where I, when I went with my mother, was, was the whole story is that I was raised by my aunt and uncle, and this happened a lot in the black community where various other members would take care of other members, and this was still out of the black experience. You know, that's something that they just did. But when I finally went with my mother, I found that it was like being in heaven. My mother was was a, a safe 
beautiful person, human being. So that's the person that I always looked up to. Now, outside of my mother, it was, you know, people like Lena Horne at the Waters, you know, because I saw a visual thing connected with whatever this creative thing was connected to that. Yeah, someone who looked like you. Not so much looked like me, but, but it was. It was that. But at the time, for me, it was just someone who had shared the same experience. Professional, you know, so yeah. all that kind of. So when it's, when it's Diane, you flow, Betty, what are you, what sort of songs are you singing? Do you know that? Oh, what we knew, what we did, let me tell you, what we did, uh, very, very obvious. Uh, Ray Charles and Flo sang all of those songs. <laughs> Flo was the, she was, she was the blues. Flo was the blues and she was the, the, the Aretha Franklin and, and, and that type of singing of person in the group. And, um, and then we, we did a lot of the Drifters songs. Diane did all of those because that was kind of more like pop. That was not so much the blues area thing, it's more pop. And I did all of the ballads. So whoever had a ballad out, I would sing that song. You know, whoever had the hit out, like Ray Charles at the time, that's what Flo was saying. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually have a question. You were talking about your mom and you were talking about your aunt and your uncle. Mm-hmm. One of the things I don't think we've ever talked about, mm-hmm. what was like life for them after your success? How did it change how did your success affect your mother, affect mm-hmm. your relatives, well, your family? Well, the family, when We the Supremes finally made it, first of all, when we started singing, we became celebrities within the family because this was something totally different from the experience. And this was part of the family. So we were celebrities even when we were not celebrities. So kids in the neighborhood who were singing had a purpose. So that was different, right? Right. In that way? If you're looking at it in retrospect, yes. But if you're looking at it at the time, it wasn't that. It was you found your calling, you found your place, you found you. This was something you did, not something that you could perceive out or someone could, you found you. And that made you special. That was what people were really after. Let's say people, black people in the, in the community, to be special, to be recognized, because we were always told you were not special. You know, you're nobody. You, you, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't go there. So this gave you a special something that no one else had but you. And it, not only was it special, it, it made people happy. You were giving, you know. And so that's why so many people went into it because of that. It was there. And I, here's something that I, I kind of stumbled upon in terms of explaining it later in life because I'm older and I understand it. And that is, people who say, when you're on that stage, you, who do you want to please? I mean, are you, you know, you're out there to please people? No, never that. It was always to please yourself. That's, that's kind of what it was all about. It was like pleasing and having that feeling of feeling good about yourself. That's something that I only sort of understood it later in life, you know, because you're always thinking that you're to please this audience. How does it feel to play for that kind of audience? How does it play for, is this audience better? I don't know. We're just up there trying to feel better ourselves. And I think if you ask most artists, if they really, really thought about it, when you're on that stage, it's almost about you, not about the audience. Mm. Now, if they like you, if they don't like you, then it becomes something (laughs) different, right? Then you got to say, okay, they didn't like me. And that's, something too, you know, if people don't like it. But, uh, you know, we found very early on that people liked us and they actually couldn't figure out the why we thought we were so good, especially at Motown. We were, I think they would think we had big heads. You know, why do Supremes think they're so good? They don't have a hit record because it's all based on hit records. But we're not, we're, it's, that's not about us, you know, we really are, when we're together, we were just so together. That's why I mentioned about the harmony part. It was, with Flo and I, the harmony was just perfect. I mean, just fit just like that. And with Diane doing whatever she did, it was just so perfect. Didn't you say that that Florence said after Barry turned you down, that he doesn't know talent? How was it? No, it it was something like that. But she said more like, hmm, he's not, uh, the hump is very important because that was Flo. Uh, hmm. He can't be that something if he doesn't know how good we are. It was that that context, you know. So you guys had confidence, which is like so much a part of how people get over. That's what right? I'm saying. 
And so, and, and, and the other artists, because we didn't get a hit record after so many times, it's like, hmm, those Supremes think they so much, they don't even have a hit record. Mm. You know, it's like, but we just felt, and it's like, okay, if that's what it takes to be who we are, then we got to get a hit record. And that's when we start really, really wanting a hit record. But before that, it was just, we wanted to be up there doing it. So Andy was saying, when you got a chance to do it, and then after the period of no hits, I want to come back to it, but I want to address this question, though. Of, you got up and sang for yourselves. You had a certain amount of confidence, even as teenagers. And then you become successful. How does that change the dynamic with your family? What does it do for your Oh, yeah, folks? that's right. Right, yeah. right, right. But I did say, I did, I did say, I did answer it. I didn't go further. And that was that they felt, felt special. Our families felt special. And as we became more and more famous, then that, of course, did change the dynamics even more. And we became... Well, the same. It was the same. We were now really special. And it was, you know, sort of not only there, whatever. Now they could share with the world that, hey, I, you know, especially my, my brother now, Roosevelt. He says, Mary, he says, when I was in the service, I don't know if he called me or whatever he said. He said, but, you know, all the guys want to know, uh, uh, you know, get in touch. with say, can you get in touch with Flo? You know, Diane, you know, and, and you and my sister, he, he, was, he was a big wheel in Vietnam. So it was that kind of thing, very, and my mom, this for, for her, I remember her face in the audience. She was always looking at me like this. Mm. Aww. So it was there, also that was their sort of happiness. You know, it, it gave them a pride within. So it was, it was not just us, it was, they were part of that. They always talk about Motown being a beehive of activity and somebody was always working now around you know, the clock. Now, you know that I want to copyright that I've said all this, right? Yes. Okay. All right, go ahead. <laughs> that they never stopped working. So would there be a particular time that they would normally record you or would you just get a phone call and they'd say, we need you at the studio. So Barry's got an idea or, or the HDH has an idea. That it's changed with time. Probably was different in the beginning. Different timing. I was going to say the different time and different things. In the beginning, recording had to do around our schedule in terms of school. So, you know, it would have to, because we were, we were in high school until uh, we did, most of Meet the Supremes, was, we were still in high school at that time. And after that, obviously, um, when we were out of school, we were free. So we could be there at any time. And we still weren't famous. So, you know, it was like, okay, you be there when you we want you. <laughs> and then once we became famous, though, it all depended on our schedule because we were out of town, a lot, out of the country. And sometimes we would fly in, record overnight, and fly right back out. So it, it all, you know, it changed with the time and all that stuff. And then most of the time, that's where, and if if it was a, a uh, one of the stars who had a, a hit record, you know, they would have priority over everything, us and anybody. You know, it's like, okay, moving out there, we got, you know. So you, had prime, so you got prime time. At once we did, get, and, once, and a yeah. lot of people were not very happy about that at Motown. <laughs> they were not happy about that at all, because I don't think they ever thought we were going to make it. They really did not. I mean, they knew we were good, but they didn't think that because we were not R and B and 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 soulful. You know, like if you put on any of the other records, I mean, it just immediately make you start dancing. The Supreme songs was not so much danceable as it was more of a an experience from up here. You know, and the other music was like dance the street, you dance and all that kind of stuff. So people didn't think that we really fit in with sort of the way Motown's music was going. You know. And I, I feel the same way. You know, I, I feel that, you know, we, we didn't care for where did our love go because it wasn't a dancing in the street, you know. And when we, we wanted that kind of, we wanted that. And uh, but just so that Holland Dozier Holland came up with this other type of sound and it hit us perfectly. I mean, even going into the Apollo, uh, I remember we were scared to death because we thought those people were going to boo us off stage. Wow. Yeah, we did. And, and so they were very quiet for the first couple of minutes or seconds. That scared the hell out of us. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. You know, we're like, okay, let me go right, let me go right, right, right you know. And uh, <laughs> so they were very, very quiet. And then pretty soon, you know, it's, you could see the hair started going and very soon stuff. And we were like, oh, okay, come on, now let's go. And then Florence got into the last part with, woohoo, she doing all that stuff. Ooh, they were they went wild, and we were like, "Whoa, we did it!" And it surprised us too, because we were accepted on our own, who we were, not as part of the Motown sound. 
you know, the sound yeah. of Motown. Because this is early days before yeah. the, the larger tours and all that stuff. Yeah, no, but more, 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 more than that. And I'm talking about the style of the singing. It was it was it was accepted differently from say when Martha and Vandellas went up there. Immediately they started rocking and rolling as soon as they stepped on stage. It was just a whole certain persona that was totally different. It encapsulated the sound as well as the look, as all of it. You know, first of all, I looked probably scared the hell out of them because here we come up there all, all prim and cute and everything this stuff, and they're like, okay, okay, what are they gonna do? You know that kind of feeling. <laughs> So there you go. That was, and that's the way we've always been. Was the Apollo when you did the Apollo? Was that the first big venue? Had you guys done the Fox or anything like that yet? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know if we have yeah, not, but the Motown Review had. It, it, it was within that same you had area. A little bit of experience on the road, but not yeah. at the Apollo, which was the pinnacle. Well, well, but, well, maybe not the Apollo, but we were on that Motown Review tour, so we had experience at all types of things. I'm, it was the Apollo that had the name of. You know, everybody sure. played there, you know. <laughs> Mahalia Jackson, I'm looking at the picture of Mahalia Jackson, you know, all these people. So, you know, you knew Apollo was the Ed Sullivan of the, <laughs> you know, of the theater. So, yeah, that was scary. That was a big time. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go back a minute to um, how do you get on a local label like Lupine? Because you're, you, like you said, you were kids in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How, how do you get on a record? Well, okay, first Before, of all... Because this is really sort of... When Motown is just beginning to form and okay. you have this little group. But- okay, so the thing is, the thing is about that is that we auditioned for the Miracles. So we met, you know, we kind of auditioned for them. And then they took our guitarist, Marvin Tarpaulin. Thank God they did because look what he created with, with Smokey and the Miracles. And then after that, we went and auditioned at Motown. Now, at the audition was very gaudy. It was Robert Bateman, who is a, one of those unsung heroes. Ray, who just passed, Gordy just passed. I think she was in on it. And there was there were some a couple of others that I can't not... Oh, um, the main person, Richard Morris, because they were songwriters, and Robert Bateman, and he was with the Ray... Ray Burr voice. So all of them were there. And after Barry said to us, come back and see me after you graduate from high school... Some of the other, and that's when we left the place and Florence said, can't be that good if he doesn't know how good we are, something like that. And so Richard and Robert all got got us and said, hey, girls, you know, we know of another record company that if you really want to get in, we can get into. So we said, okay. And we went to the other record company. Now, in that, a lot of people are not aware. We did background for lots of people like Wilson Pickett, the Falcons. And uh, this other guy, Floyd. Eddie Floyd. Eddie Floyd. And probably a few more. We did a lot of background with them. And uh, even though the company was doing all that stuff, we still had our eye on Motown. Sure. That's where we went. So after we had been at Lupin, I'm not sure how long it was, maybe two, three months, maybe a little bit more than that, not much longer. Then we decided, you know what, let's just go back in there. And that's when we started sitting on the lawn and started... Uh, <laughs> And one day somebody, I, we, I can't even remember who the producers were, but somebody came out and said, we need some hand claps or background singers. We can't get in touch. We've got this session we got to do. We said, we'll do it. And that's how we got in. I have a question uh, about your hanging out at Motown before they were letting you in. Were there a lot of other people hanging out? No. It was just you guys. No, there was nobody hanging out. And then, <laughs> no, we were the only ones. Right, right. Confidence and determination. That's right. right. Now, later on. We started a whole new trend. Right. <laughs> right. Separate, separate thought, but same concept. Later on, now Motown is famous. Mm-hmm. People come from all over the world. Yeah, were they like trying to just constantly just trying to get into the front door? Did they have to have like security to keep people there? Did Motown? There was no one there. That, that was not so something pe- that happened. Even, so no. that the whole paparazzi thing that happens now and then with, with crazy fans you know, running and them. stalking places, they didn't do any of that. They didn't have to worry about it. Okay. That was just a concept that happened. Yeah. I, hear about, I mean, I hear about plenty of people who said, oh yeah, I used to go visit Detroit and drive by and there's Eddie, David, yeah, we'd Mary. all be hanging out there. That's who'd be hanging, hanging out. out there. We would, and we would never, be hanging never out to stop in. Like I, my father worked for Ford Motor Company, and mm-hmm. twice a year he'd go to Detroit. Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. I got old enough, he would take me. We'd go to Tigers games. Mm-hmm. I never thought, mm-hmm. well, Motown's just around the corner. Why didn't I? It wasn't. Why didn't the, it I go? wasn't Nobody it, thought of that. It wasn't the same time frame when all that was going on. You know, probably in the late sixties. You know, when it became 
more popular around wherever it was. You know, you as you said, you know, people who lived there and Motown was so popular, they'd always say, and there's that place, Motown, that kind of thing. But you didn't, people didn't venture in. I think the old people I always saw was just the artists and the producers and the people who worked there. That's who'd be hanging around because we all were really very much very close. You know, I saw uh, one of the ladies, I can't think of her name right now, but she worked there. I saw her at the Motown Musical with Janie Bradford and a lot of other people. And uh, they were, they were the family. They were part, they were just as well known and liked as the artists were, you know. So it was, that was the family. Curious to know when you, uh, you're working a lot with Smokey in the beginning. And then Eddie, uh, Brian and Lamont. Well, we work we, we work with other people before Smokey though, the postman, the, the mailman. Uh, what's Gorman. his name? Freddie Gorman, Barry, and Barney Ellis wrote the butter popcorn. <laughs> so we had people like that who sure. did a couple of things, and then we moved up to Smokey, and then we moved to Holland Dozier Holland, and never really worked with anyone else there. Well, did you see any difference between Smokey and the Hollands? And Holland Dozier, like, what, what were the Well, you look at My Girl and you look at, uh, yeah, they're just different. They were different. They were what just was different. It the, rel- the working relationship for you, what was that like? You go in and Smokey's directing a session and then you walk in and well, there's you know, Brian you know, you know, It's all about personality, isn't it? It's about different personalities you're working with. And so they all, what they all had in common was that they were all extremely creative and you knew that when they said something about a song, about this, that I, you knew that they knew what they were talking about. It was very obvious, you know. That's that's one thing I love being there. And I've always said this, is that you, we were working with geniuses. Didn't know it, but still you, you did because you felt good in the care. What they were telling you was right. Mm-hmm. Even some of the, uh, the artists who say, for instance, uh, were great singers, I mean, before they went with the producers that they were with. The producers had the knowledge of the recording end of it. You had your knowledge of your singing, whatever. And so it's like a tailor. You know, they know how to put stitch everything together, but what about your body? What about your body? Mm-hmm. Now, making something for your body might be this particular tailor's mm-hmm. expertise. And that's what made it so different. So with a person like Smokey and a person like uh, the group like Holland Dosha Holland, you were put with people who knew what kind of body you had, and they would frame it for your body. Now, if they had to switch and work with you, they they say, well, you know, that's not going to work. We got to frame it a different way. Let's try it this way. And they always were able to do that. You know, that was great. In terms of the individual personalities, uh, Smokey was was uh, was fun to work with in that he, you always got Smokey, you know, you, hey, man, no, 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 you, you always got that, you know, no matter how, what he was doing with you. So you had that. And and it was comfortable. His demeanor was very comfortable. Uh, Holland Doja Holland were a little more complex in that you had three individuals you're working with, so each one had a certain type of uh, approach to you as as singers, and so we had to deal with that. But that too was okay because they were very clear. Very Eddie was very clear in control of everything. <laughs> uh, uh, Brian was a very quiet kind of serious kind of person in a way. And then you had Lamont, who was, uh, Lamont was a bona fide singer, you know. So you're coming from these three different people, but they all really worked well together. I always loved working with them, I felt. And Eddie had this way of of working with a, a lead singer, say, yeah. who, who, say, some working with Levi Stubbs, who was a great singer. I mean, who would think you have to tell him how to do anything? But Eddie had a way of saying, man, you know, let's try it, try it this way. Da, 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 here. And he would give you specifically the way it's supposed to, be, to have been sung. And I think that this was something that he had, he had a great feel for the solo artists, knowing how to have them to bend away from them, their natural way and get it another way and still be as great as they were in the beginning. But they kind of stretched them, in other words. Yeah. And he had that. always, Marvin and Levi, they would have them go a little bit higher in key. He was, yeah. But they had everybody doing that. get them. They had everybody doing that. But they had Diana do that. She was already up there. You know, she was already up there, but still that was their thing too. Because if they said, 
and I believe it. That's why they never wanted me up there. If you listen to songs, people, when they sing very high, like Michael Jackson, I mean, to me, it's like, it hurts my ear. Okay, I, I can't stand it. But that's they for recording, they feel that that's a better way of getting the getting through. And and if you think about it, it really is. No, I I wasn't crazy about it that way. But that's what they did. Yeah, record a little higher because then you get a little more intensity mm-hmm. going to it. So that's what they were talking about. So Eddie said that he wanted you on Where Did Our Love Go? Well, they thought because of my voice, yes. singing the ballads, he wanted that sound. So uh, of course he was outweighed because. Barry had already said, Diane's going to be singing the lead on everything. So that was fine. But what they did was they put me a little closer to the mic. And if you listen to it, you only hear me and Diane. We've actually had to isolate it. I had to isolate it because I wanted to make sure Flo yeah, was she, actually she there. Was and there. she was there. You no, could hear there. it. But, but, but that was that, that was not It's not, not a sound. mixed thing. It's the way you stood. Yeah. That's what I want people to understand. Because that was cut on three tracks. There aren't a lot of tracks for vocals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So your placement was... I was in front, my voice closer. was in front of, and yes, and so close. that my voice was more significantly, yeah. but she was still there. And so they did that on with certain sounds, and a lot of the, and now some songs, uh, I don't know if it was Come See or one of the others, all you, not all you hear, but you hear Flo, because she's close and her voice cuts through on that. So it just depends on what, you know, they want to. I'm curious about, sorry, about Eddie told me that he would get a tape of a backing track, go write the lyrics and come back and then work with the singers. Did he work with the backgrounds? Did he work Who's with Who's this, Eddie? Eddie Holland. Did he work with you and Flo or just uh, Diana? Eddie was mostly the the the, the soul, lead. The, the lead. Yeah. He mostly, but I mean, he still, as I mentioned, he was overall everything. You know, he would say, man, maybe we did, you know, he was over, but he worked with mainly the lead singers. So did you do your own backgrounds? Well, you're forgetting about Lamont. Hey, tell me. No, what I mean is people, you guys, you know, this is a, that was, the, Lamont did the backing vocals. That that was who he worked with. But he also was a part of the music thing as well. And I think, I think Lamont did a lot of the lyrics. I think he did a lot of the, the songwriting part of it. But he worked with, in terms of forming and getting all the backing vocals, he basically, that was his kind of area that he worked with. Even though he too was over everything. You know what I mean? In fact, they all were. But they all had their certain expertise where they could contribute more. Jumping just a slight jump ahead. Once everybody was part of the process where you were working with Charlie Atkins and you were working with Maurice King and you were working with Harvey Fuqua, Mm -hmm. did you have a favorite part of that process? What was your favorite part? Was it, you know... I didn't have any part that I wasn't favorite of. (laughs) I loved it all. Uh, The the one thing that was really great was uh, combining the after you record it, then you go in to put the music to the steps that that's a whole nother, well, as they say, ball game. I don't hate to use a, a phrase like that, but it's a, a whole nother ball game because it's it's like trying to say you you sing a song and then you think of the song in this way when you're singing it in your mind lyrically what all that's about. Then when you're doing the the steps, it's not so much about the lyrics. You know, it might be about the music. It might be about what's in between the music. You know, people say you have all this, but what what's in the silence? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times Charlie would come with movement within the silence. Sometimes it would be like, stop, right on it. Mm-hmm. So all that you have to, and for people to say that, you know, groups, uh, the backing vocalists, and people have said this, didn't have to work as hard to lead. That's bull. Because whenever you have more than one person and you're trying to synchronize certain things, it's, it's, it's hard work. Because even the people, you know, who are doing it, have to feel the other person. I know I've seen a lot of pictures of Flo and I, and if my hand was like this, hers was too, the same way. Of course. Now, if you see some with Cindy, with the voice. if you see something with Cindy, hers would be totally, <laughs> if I'd be here, and hers would be somewhere like here. And if, if you're not thinking about it, it's no difference, but it really is. That's what made our group more, you know, sort of stand out in terms of the, the choreography, because it was always like, it was like the double mint twins. <laughs> whom I know, by the way. I know usually when you did television, it was live, but sometimes it was taped. What was it like for you to see your group for the first time visually by being at home and watching yourself on TV? I rarely had a chance to watch Do you it. ever get to see it? Even your... now, I still haven't sure. seen it. I mean, people sending me things. I've got to sit down now that I'm doing the book. I don't know if Harry's way I'm doing a, a coffee table book based on the gowns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so now that I'm really doing the research for a lot of that, 
you know, I'm able to look at a couple of shows and I'm like, oh, God, I forgot we had, you know, oh, OK. Oh, that's, oh, yeah. I'm seeing now what we actually visually look like. Again, for me, it was just us doing it. Never really stepped back and look at, looked at the shows. Yeah, it's amazing when you look at like the Steve Allen show, for example, where you look like they're in homemade dresses. Is that right? Um, Pretty much. Which what what do we do? Like sixty four. What do we do? Red velvet gowns, nineteen sixty four. Well, uh, I thought that was Kennedy. What's his name? And I think I think it's the same dress. Yeah, the red. Yeah. And then you know you go to Ed Sullivan and you've got the more famous Mm -hmm. gowns. Mm -hmm. How many Mm -hmm. times were they in Ed Sullivan? Sixteen. Is that the record? You Mm -hmm. think? I think it's the record. record. Except except for the Topo Gigi. Yeah, Topo (laughs) Gigi. It's been on more. (laughs) Yeah, I think we got the record. If not the closest to it, if not, but it was 16. You know, I think we, we've, we've spent time, Andy knows you personally better than I do, and we've, we have spent some time together. But there does come a moment where you look up and you go, oh, that's you. Like, you look at Ed Sullivan, mm-hmm. and I look and I go, wait, that's, that's actually Mary Wilson of the Supremes. Do oh. you ever have that perspective and look oh, no. and go, I oh, did you that? Mean me. Yeah, me. I did that. In a different way, in a different way, yes. Yeah, well, it's but you. I, what I mean is, I don't know. I, I had to answer that um, because I, I I was there and I did it. So no, for me, it's more like just revisiting, re, just seeing what I did, not not realizing it's me or not, mm-hmm. but seeing me doing it as opposed to doing it. That's a different perspective, and it's a uh, for me, it's a little. Awkward. I, I'm like most actors who don't like to see themselves, whatever. And it's not that I don't like to see myself. It's just that, uh, you know, I did it. So it's, that's it. Now, in retrospect, to look back on it for this research that I'm doing, it's good because I get a chance to see what people were seeing, what they may have been thinking, and what I actually was thinking myself. Totally different. I had, I had Oprah Winfrey say to me one day, how does it feel to have been the prettiest girl in the Supremes? I'm like, I never thought about that. Never, ever, ever into my mind. I remember Carolyn Franklin. I may have told you this. You might see it in the book. Carolyn Franklin, when I, the first group I was in, ever in was in Carolyn Franklin's group in Detroit. And the girl, there was a girl in the group who came up and started trying to beat me up. And so I asked, when I was writing my first book, I asked Carolyn, I interviewed, you know, a lot of people. And I asked Carolyn Franklin, I said, why did that girl try to, why did she jump on me? She says, well, did it ever occur to you that you were pretty? I'm like, no, I was just trying to get the group to sing. So those kind of things, when I see something like that, I'm like, okay, well, I was kind of cute, but I didn't think I was cute. But but the thing is, I didn't that think That wasn't I was... where your confidence came from. Your yeah. confidence came from you just had a drive to do something. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like I'm the prettiest. No, I mean, never, ever. I mean, I thought we all were pretty. Sure. You know what I mean? In my mind. Everybody's got different flavor. In my, in right? my mind, I was thinking we, I mean, I never thought of that. I never even thought people would think about that. That was the other thing that was surprising to me when I really felt like, is that what people are thinking? You know, oh my God, how small of us. <laughs> there you go. Let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about sex, baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to say that it was right on time. Go ahead. I didn't think Well, speaking right of which, now. Marvin Gaye. <laughs> Sexual what's, healing. What's it like seeing other artists? Were there other artists you looked up to when you were young and... And starting out of Motown, the Miracles were doing something, but Smokey was a guy from the neighborhood. Did you see him as this larger figure? From Diane's neighborhood, I didn't know him. Oh, okay. that I, she, she was the one who, she actually was the one who, who got us the interview because she yeah. knew him from she another neighborhood, him. from another but neighborhood. But did you look up to him? Looked up to all, yeah, all, all of those way. people. Yeah, oh yeah. Because you know, you admired the talent. And, and, and it was now not something that was just on radio, or I can't even say TV then, because it wasn't really on TV. It was somebody that's close in your proximity to you, to your, now you could, you know, and so not only admired them, uh, you know, yeah, admired the talent. I mean, the talent was first. It's like when you hear, it was like music. Mu- oh, well, it is music. What I'm talking about is like music. But yeah, admired that totally. Did you grow totally. closer in as your success went on, because you now had this shared experience, you were all becoming so successful together. 
in the world where they're, you know, you're traveling the world and you're all they're having that shared, yes, that, that shared experience. And then you would come back and you'd be in, in the studio oh, yeah. and maybe the temps of the tops or Marvin they or did. somebody. And you were like, you know, we were just here. You, we were just there. You we know, were, you know, the first time we did something, I hate to interrupt you, but you reminded me of this. And that was uh, our first sort of bubbling under uh, when the love light shine. It was, uh, I think it was some of the four tops and temptations who was on that. Yeah. You know, ah! You know, they were all on that. But yeah, it's like a family reunion. And every time we're together, I mean, every time. It, it is as if it was yesterday. I, uh, Brenda Holloway. Brother Holloway, yes. I, I get Holiday and Holloway mixed up on the Hudson, you know, the two ladies. I get the. Jennifer, yeah, Jennifer Hudson, Jennifer Holiday, Brenda Holloway. Hudson, Jennifer Holloway. And Brenda, Brenda Holloway. Holloway. See, I always, I always get that mixed up. Anyway, she was at the Motown musical. I haven't seen her in oh, a little while. And so, you know, it's like, like, like my cousin, Josephine, it was like, hey, Brad, what's happening? You know, it's like you just, and it's been 50 some years. So it's that same way with most of us. Most of us. <laughs> anyway, there you go. You have to look behind the curtains. Say what now? Uh, Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye, that was what? What was your Marvin impression Gaye. of Marvin? We all love Marvin. First, I, I have to say, we. And Marvin was one of those creatures that it was his soul. It, it wasn't sexual. It was. It was. There was something about just oozed out that was just so sweet, so warm, so gentle, so all of that. And it was that was. And we all the girls were like, mm, you know, and you wouldn't do that to all the other guys. You might like him or say something, but it wasn't the same. Marvin had a different thing. And I remember that when we did one of the first Motown Review tours and, and all of us girls were trying to teach him how to do the hitchhike because he couldn't dance. Marvin couldn't dance. He could not move. I'm trying not to laugh, but I know. What you're could saying. not move, did not know. And so all the girls were just trying to, we all wanted to get in and teach him how to move the hips and do the whole thing. <laughs> it, it was Claudette, it was Vandellas, it, it was all of us, all the girls. That's great. Could not dance. The man could not dance. So Those are my go. favorite stories, things like that. Mm. What about little Stevie? You well, we were, we were there, and they didn't put that into play. We were there when he first auditioned. I know they can't put everything in there. And so you Barry, can tell it now. It's all right. Barry said, oh, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll tell whatever I want to tell, and some things I'm not telling. But this one I'm going to tell because it's so cute. We were called the girls. We would follow Barry around everywhere he went. This was before he hit records. And so he was, like, showing us the whole thing, you know. Barry would always take us around, and anything new happening in that day, he would say, okay, girls, um, there's a little guy coming around here, and they call him Stevie Wonder, and he's a genius. And, well, we didn't know what the hell a genius was at that age, right? We're like every bit of 15. And so we're like, oh, okay, great. So um, here comes this little kid, you know, walking around, and his mom was with him, and, and we're looking, so that's the genius. Okay, what, let's see what this genius is all about. And then he jumped on the, the, the organ. They had the organ there at the time. He started playing the organ. He started playing the drum, drums. <laughs> he played everything in there. We're like, oh, okay, that's what a genius is. <laughs> so we were there the first day that he came in. I, and I always remember that because it was like, we didn't know what to expect from this genius. And, and he was black. You know, you didn't hear about any, any black geniuses back in those days, right? <laughs> so this was like really... Really, a, a very precious moment. I always will remember that. You know, years later, when he produced you on Bad Weather. Bad Weather. It was great working with Stevie. I mean, he was just phenomenal. Uh, I hate it when it, it stopped. I don't know why it stopped, or what. You know, there's a lot of politics going on there. Who knows what was going on? But it was Linda Lawrence who who got us with Stevie because she, you know she was part of his group, The Wonder Love. Right? Yeah. So that's and when I got her in the group. Then this kind of came up, and she says, "Well, you want?" I'm like, "Yeah," and he did it. I was very surprised. So that was really that was great working with him. He was. He was it must have been so cool thinking about you know he's producing me, and he was his star had was so big at that time, and you're like, "Look at him producing us," and a little kid yeah. well, who's yeah, playing out all the instruments. Yeah, we're weren't, weren't we having a lot of trouble with Motown? Yeah, it was very difficult. That was that was a difficult yeah, period in, for me. In between records. Yeah, that was. A, so was what was it mean? Difficult. You guys were gonna. We'll jump forward a little bit because I think the Motown stuff has been rehashed a lot. You've talked about it a lot. Certainly, some things we want to ask you. Depending yeah, yeah. On your time. We're gonna do it another time too. But you know, your difficulty. Um, you know, Diana's become a solo star and is 
oh, rising yeah, 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 as yeah. she had when you were all in the group together. Mm -hmm. So what was difficult for you? Well, let, let, me, let me visit that period. First of all, it was very difficult, not so much about Diane, but about Flo. The difficulty there was that uh, when Flo was in the group, we had a group. And I had someone to bounce off of on what was going on. With Flo not there, first of all, the group was not the same. They were not caring about us as a group. They were not recording us as a group, which really pissed me off. And that's when I made my biggest, I don't know what it was, I won't say mistake, but that's when I didn't do Love Child because I was very pissed. And um, when they decided to, to record this, they decided at a time when I was going on my vacation. And I had all made all these plans, so I couldn't do it. So I was really pissed about that. But the, the, during that time, as I said, Flo was the, my major disappointment at the time in terms of what was going on. Then when we got Gene into the group, and it was Barry Gordy who got her, which I I was, once he, he said, Mary, you got to hear this girl. Because I didn't know what I was going to do, stay in the group or not. I had no idea, you know, and no, there were no plans. No one's asking me anything, no one's whatever. So it's, I had to make up my own mind. So when he, I said, okay, let me let me hear her. And so he got it together and I heard Gene. And so I knew at that point, okay, my mind's made up now. I will stay with the group because I got someone who I really liked her sound. It was very, it was close to Diane's actually, but that wasn't what I was crazy about. I was crazy about the fact that she had a really soulful approach to the music and she was very musical. So that just convinced me. So up to that point, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to go on or stop or whatever. And uh, so we went on and, and started recording with Gene, and I was very happy. But at the same time, we were still touring with Diane. So I had these two things going on. <laughs> That's right. I had these two right. things going on. Leading it was up, Leading up to the announcement. Yeah, it was very, it was, a, it was yeah. to say it was a bad period for me. I've never had a lot of bad periods in my life, but that was one of them. It was one of them because I was not treated as a supreme. I was not... On one side, on one side. And then the other side, we had this great thing with Frank Wilson who started recording us and, and the music was really good and I was getting very excited about that. So I had these two different things going on me. Uh, but it was there was a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, because uh, I could see that, okay, we ha I have a way of continuing on. At, at, before that, I didn't know if I had a way of continuing on. I was too afraid to even try to take it on myself because I knew I couldn't. I wasn't qualified for it. So it really scared me because I wanted to continue to sing. I loved, loved it. And this really helped things, whatever. But it was also the time when Motown sort of, they were sort of with us and then they kind of just abandoned us in a way. And, uh, you know, that was very hurtful. Uh, I was very happy about what was happening with Diane. I was happy she was getting, you know, certain things. And we were getting certain things. And then it just sort of fell apart. And it was very scary for me. You know, it's an interesting time and where no there's one, growing know, no pains. No one have, never one stopped asking me what I wanted. That was that was the, probably the biggest disappointment. What did, I, so what I did had you want? No, I, had no, I had no help in that. The only thing that helped me was hearing Gene's voice. Powerful. Other than that, I had no help. And I was, I was really That's alone. It's a powerful thing to say, though, about somebody. That, that she true. really touched you in a way you thought, oh, I can live my life now. I can continue. And then I can make my decision about my life. It made me know that now I've got to prepare myself to continue this on. How am I going to do that? So I started at that moment to start teaching myself, not myself, but, you know, getting voice classes, taking the acting classes, doing all those kind of things my, on my own. And that's what I did to, to, to carry on. And that's how I'm sitting here today from that moment. Other, before that, I didn't know that. And, and as I said, I had to, had to decide, make my own decision. And, 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 and Motown had been making all the decisions for us. So now here I am all of a sudden, I got to make these decisions. And they're like, I don't know what to do. I know I don't want to quit. So you're in your, you're in your late yeah, I don't know. 20s then? Yeah, People yeah. are. I was, I was hard, hard at math. What was it? You were in your twenties. You were still in your twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's you know there's growing pains. I mean Motown had growing pains because they're getting ready to. Barry's getting ready to move to L.A. Well, well, with Cindy and, and they got Cindy in there. Cindy and I moved here. We moved to L.A. before Motown did. Yeah. So we we were the first ones to move here. Interesting transition time. She came first, and then they all loved it and followed her. Wow. So yeah, sixties are growing up. Moving into the 70s, Motown's growing up, you're having to grow up, but no help. 
So you were were you going to ask Mary about well, that? Well, I was. I was. Like but, if someone asked. You, yeah, if someone you? had asked you before Jean, at that point you knew she was, you knew Diana was leaving or thought she might be anyway and before the announcement had come. If somebody had asked you and you had had a chance to sit and think about it, what do you think you would have decided to do at that point? I, well, I would have continued singing some kind of way. But still, if I had to do, if I had to, you know, find other outlets, I would do that. But I would definitely have uh, pursued some kind of career, but I would have, I, I know I would have had to prepare. I was not prepared for it vocally. Uh, I know that. But, 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 but I, I would have done something in the business, even if it were to start acting, whatever I would have done, or TV, I, I would have done a lot, anything in the business. I was prepared to stay in the business some kind of way. But once Jean came on, you really dove into all of it. You, I took over the everything. Voices, we, voice lessons, but also the business affairs, everything. You took all that on. Supreme yeah, I took over. I told them I had, to, I had to take it over. I had to be in control. I mean, did they realize that happened right away? Motown's this? always been scared of me because they certainly act like it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, sometimes I am treated like a, a half-sister by a lot of them. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, it's okay because I realized that, uh, you know, for so long I, I allowed people to do that. So I took over the business the management. And I did it slowly, though. I didn't, you know, I did it slowly. I took my time to find, uh, you know, a couple of people. And um, that's also when I published my book, too. And so there was all a backlash about all, a lot of that because of the, the name Supremes and, you know, I was fighting for that. So, you know, it was it was a lot going on at the time. But I started, yes, preparing myself by uh, getting in, involved, totally involved in the business. Well, I was going to ask a question. I haven't quite formulated how to ask it. So, um, Well, we can do this again. Okay. Okay. And even if we have to do some things on the phone, sure. if you want. Yeah, it's a little before this. one. Now, do you want to, yeah. are you going back to the hotel? I need, I need I, first of all, I need to eat. That's my mom, Mary Wilson, as always, getting ready for her next show. We love you, mom. And miss you.